Nice to meet you all. Uh, can you all hear me in this? Good? If you can at any point, just raise your hand, get my attention. I'll be, uh, try to remember to be not looking totally internally and be looking out at you to see what, you, what you're thinking. I want you to ask me questions at any time. I brought along a number of uh, speaking points, but they're really designed to stimulate discussion. A lot of, I guess, uh, Peter gave you a kind of an overview. I'm going to go down from 30,000 feet to maybe 10. Before I became a lawyer, I was a therapist. And I've spent uh, a good portion of my life uh, really integrating the tools that are common to both in both professions. When I was a therapist, I had to deal with human behavior. It had problems, sometimes it had legal problems, and my interest in public policy eventually took me uh, to, uh, to the area of law. For those of you who are a second chance kind of people, I w went to law school when I was age 29, which uh, I guess kind of proves up the idea if you don't choose right first, keep choosing. I had, uh, was an undergraduate psychology philosophy major, and I got a graduate degree in psychology, and then I got a graduate degree in public administration, and then I went to law school. And it was all part of the process. And if there's something that I can leave you all with that I think will be valuable, it's to recognize yourself as historical beings. You're going to change over time. Things that seem important today will seem less important later. The appetites of today will transform. Things that, and, and it happens, and I was just telling my son this uh, this morning. We were talking about change over time. And I don't know uh, whether uh, this is going to be as meaningful to you as it is to me, but when I was a, a young guy, in my 20s, uh, my hair was a little bit longer, and I used to carry around an Afro comb. And why? It had a big handle. And I was working as a therapist in a hospital. And people would say, why are you doing that? And I'd say, because it feels right. It just feels right. And I, and I persisted, even though people were saying, you know, it's not good, it's not, that that's not the way you should look. I said, it's the way I feel. One day, I was getting ready to go to work. And I combed my hair, and I, was, I had the big handle in my hand. I was just about to stick it in my back pocket. And I went, not anymore. Put it down, never went back. Things happen like that. There's, a, there's an old saying that there's nothing so ripe as an idea whose time has come. It was time for me to move on to a different idea, a different perception of myself. I think all of you, I, I, and I recommend that to the extent you can keep a journal, do it. It is actually rewarding to look back 20 years later and see what it is you were thinking on December 25th, 1985. It's, it's satisfying, it's steadying, and you can see your personal growth and you can see your odyssey. And, and all of this is a, really an odyssey. You know, I've been a therapist, I've been a prosecutor, I've been in private practice, I've been in government. These are all steps on my road. Your roads may be different. Some of you may actually, you know, already know exactly what it is you want to do, and you should thank God for that. Uh, life is simpler when you've mapped out a, a path, and you, and you know from math and logic, that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And you have to decide whether you want sweep or you know, you have a goal and you know how to accomplish it. So for those of you that uh, want to be business people and you know what you want to do, go for it. Uh, you know, I've got a son right now that I can't get him to go to college. I mean, I was in college for 10 years. You know, I, was work I worked most of the 10 years that I was going to school. But, uh, 
he's he wants to start a business, and until you know, and if it works, he'll look at me and go, "See," and if it doesn't, he'll have to do what we all have to do. He'll choose again, and that's something all of you will have to deal with. When is the idea no longer viable? When is it sunk money? How do you make that decision and get your ego out of the deal? Because your ego's in the deal. You don't want to accuse yourself of being a quitter. You don't want to accept defeat. But do you really want to spend 30 years doing something that you should have stopped 25 years ago? It's so what life is all about is what business is all about. At some point, you've got to know when to pull the plug. One of the thoughts that I had in trying to prepare for this is when you start a business, whenever you do anything, you've got to surround yourself with good people. Find people you can trust and trust them. Now, I don't want to be Pollyannish. Borrowing from Reagan, who I hold in high regard, though I'm a registered Democrat, trust but verify. It's important to keep a critical attitude. You know, be quick to notice things, slow to accuse, and certain, certain to remember and document. And believe me, when you get into an organization, human resources, it's, it's poo-pooed by a lot of people. But it, if it's not done well, it'll take you down. The number of lawsuits for fraternization, why somebody gets a promotion, why somebody doesn't get a promotion, the fact that there may have been a relationship that uh, is no longer there and the next promotion isn't forthcoming when there was the last four personnel reviews are all flattering and now suddenly they're the worst employee in the entire organization. All of these things will haunt you. You've got to take the time to get it right. My, my recommendation, you know, if you're in love, you're in love. The extent that you can keep fraternization out of the workplace is probably a good risk-averse strategy, you know. And, uh, but it's important. Document everything. And, and I can tell you, as, as, you know, I served as chief of staff to the county executive. When you have a bad employee, they're like a black hole. They suck all of the vitality out of the organization. You spend so much time just talking about this person. You know, what do we do? How do we document? You, you, this is your job. You make sure that you follow, that you, everything this person does wrong, you need to build the record. And then there may be levels of discipline that you have to go through. And while that person isn't working, all the people around them are. And then they're saying to themselves, what am I, stupid? I'm working hard every day. That person's there doing nothing and you're not doing anything about it. These are the things that you're going to need to deal with if you're in somebody else's business. It's going to be painful, certainly painful, if the business is your own. My recommendation, I mean, you know, you don't want to have to, you don't, really don't want to be willy-nilly because it's expensive to train people for a job. And if somebody comes in, it may take them six months to a year to kind of get up to speed. When you get, if you get rid of that person, uh, there's another cost. There's another year maybe before you find somebody else and you don't know if that person's really going to work out necessarily. So uh, I think there was a presidential candidate uh, that once said, uh, measure twice and cut once. When you hire people, try to make sure they're the right person to hire. And if they're really toxic, if they're just bad. If, and one of the ways you can tell is if people are just constantly talking, not with them, but about them, about their anger, their venting. If it's your business, you are paying for that venting. When somebody's toxic, you got to get them out of the organization. And you want to do it legally, you want to do it right, and you may have to uh, make sure that you have a reserve for legal counsel to handle you in the lawsuit that often comes. For those of you that want to start businesses, there's something to using other people's dime. And, and that's my thought that I want to share with you. 
be deliberative, learn your craft, and if you can, learn the business on somebody else's dime. Go through, you know, if you, you want to open restaurants, work at a restaurant for a while. Get paid to understand that business. If you want to be a lawyer, work at a bigger law firm, even if you want to work at a smaller one. See how it can be done when there's lots of material, lots of people to do all the little things that need to be done. Uh, there's something to be said about uh, diving into the pool. There's also something to be said about kind of dipping your toe in it, checking the water, making sure it's not the shallow end. Uh, and then when you go in, you go in with confidence and aware of the environment. My next thought here is trust your instincts, but protect yourself. Seek legal and business counsel early on in the process. And I'm not immune to this. And this is one of the, one of the problems of not having an infinite amount of money. You've got to make decisions about how to spend it, how to allocate it. And one of the things that you think you can get by with early on is, God, lawyers, they're 300, 400, 500, 600 dollars an hour. I can't afford that right now. So I'll, do, I'll go on the internet, I'll do it myself. Well, it, there's really two sides to that. You can either go to the lawyer, who's the setup lawyer, who will incorporate you, draft your agreements, do your leases, get you moving, get your, help you get your licenses. And, and by the way, uh, and this happens a lot, and you know, these, this, these are the kinds of problems that I, that I deal with. If you ever have a partner that is insistent on not bringing legal counsel into the deal before you start, your alarm should be clanging. Because it is only a matter of time before the romance becomes apparent that it was... Uh, faulty to begin with. I mean, that's just my experience. I, I don't hear about the ones that go well, but I do hear about the ones that don't. And it, it is so important to have documentation. I mean, if you think you're going to be a 50% owner, probably helpful to have an, something in writing that the other person, either a confirming email or as you, you know, as you agreed, I'm going to be a 50% owner if I put up X amount of dollars. If you don't have the full document, make sure that you have something that was sent to them that you can prove, hopefully that they even signed, that says, yep, you're gonna be a partner and this is what we're gonna do. And it's always good in those initial agreements to have, what do you do when the divorce happens? How do you handle it? You know, do you have, how much do you have money are you gonna to have to spend to value your share? Or are you gonna get drugged into oblivion by somebody that may have more resources than you? And that's always something, again, it's important to have money behind you, but if you get into somebody, I mean, I've, I know people, I've represented people. Good people, tough business people, they have lots of money. If they decide that uh, now the business actually looks like it's gone somewhere and they could do without you, that money that you thought was gonna be at your disposal is gonna be opposing you and your assertion of an ownership interest. Uh, it's very important to have documents. It makes the litigation simpler. It doesn't mean they're not going to get sued. It doesn't mean they're not going to try to beat you up. But at least you have something to fight with. What often happens is, is that people just go, you know, like if you're doing a deal for a big contractor or something, a construction project, and you save your profit for the last payment, you know, installment payment, and the other guy knows that, and he decides he really doesn't want to pay it to you, and he Next time he's gonna use somebody else anyway. And you go, well, I'm gonna fight you. You know, I'm gonna lean your project. And he goes, fine, we'll litigate it. But if you're a small business person living pretty much paycheck to paycheck, what are you gonna, how are you gonna pay your employees? And if you don't pay your employees, they're going to disperse. You won't be able to do your next project, you'll be in default. And so all of these pressures come to bear and you say, okay, look, why don't we just agree I'll take 50% of the last payment and I'll sign the, the release of liens. Happens all the time. 
the, know who you're dealing with. It, it's so important to have people that you can trust. It makes life so much easier. But you got to build your agreements as if you can't. I mean, even if you're in business with somebody, they may sell their interest. They may die. You know, that's one of the things about being mortal, is it happens. Somebody else comes in, you know, for 25 years you've been doing deals on a handshake. But that handshake is only as good as the moral sentiment of the person that offers the hand. Get somebody new in there, you're screwed. This is a, I was kind of musing when I was trying to think about what it is I wanted to talk about today. And I remember, I, I went to school in D.C. I went to law school in D.C. And one of the associate deans there was a, he was just a good guy and we kind of befriended one another. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to mention his name. It's kind of, but it's an, an interesting thought. We were talking about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And he was African-American. And he said to me, Dennis, that's, that's the problem in the black community. We don't have enough money or enough know-how to do it by ourselves. And we don't trust anybody enough to do it with a partner. Now, that is not unique to the black community. It is the way many people are. When you get into a business relationship, uh, you've got to have some measure of trust. But the, tr the trust that you really need in, in, in any entrepreneur, the trust is in you, that you can overcome the treachery and bad judgments in whom you've reposed trust. You've got to be You've got to be able to come back from the brink. And some of the people that I know that are the most successful, I mean, they're incredibly wealthy today, failed. But they looked at failure as a step on the way to success. Some of them filed for bankruptcy. Some of them were, one of them who now owns a mutual fund, too, was, uh, went through a divorce, because that often happens when things are going south. You know, Money pressures attack your sense of self-worth, your liberties, your ability to relax and communicate. Family matters tend to go to hell in a handbasket at times. He found himself sleeping on the floor of a friend, a friend's house. But he pulled himself together and uh, did what it is he was good at. He was good at sales, good at securities, sales in particular. Went to a, found a way, because he was very active in the community, to parlay that into, I know lots of people, that, high net worth people that uh, could become my clients. And they did. And after spending about 15 years learning the trade <clears throat> uh, in the securities business, he ended up opening uh, his own mutual fund. And he's very successful today. Uh, but I guess that's really the hallmark. Don't let failure be the last, the la have the last word. Uh, I've already mentioned this, but it's worth saying again. My note is understand the importance of agency. It's important to get somebody else's malpractice insurance and fiduciary duty on your side. Uh, it, it, when you buy somebody, when you hire a lawyer, you hire an accountant, you hire a financial advisor, they've got a legal duty to, to do what is standard in the industry in way of providing advice and sharing their expertise. Put it to work for you. First of all, you need to have somebody um, there to protect you, somebody that's got your back. And I, I guess uh, associated with that, I've already talked about the importance of having lawyers in the setup. Part of that, if you have intellectual property, this is kind of a, uh, not a damning thought, but uh, to me at least an interesting thought. If you have a really good idea, it's probably worth stealing. And so you need to protect it. And for the same reasons that I said earlier that 
for the same reasons um, that I said earlier that uh, you, you, need to get, you need to get the legal things out of the way so that you can do what it is you do best. I have often been called upon on the back end to say, I entered, I entered into this deal and now they're using my idea. And, and I'm not gonna, there was a famous, let me, I'm not gonna name the person because I haven't checked the source, but I have it on reasonably good authority that a household word it was a great entertainer with a great, great baritone voice uh, years ago. Um, made as much money outside of show business as he did inside it by disputing the intellectual property of others. And, for the, and it's, it's all about power. You have money at your disposal. You have people that have an idea. You attack the patent. You leave it to them to sue you. You have more money than them. At some point, when they get tired of getting $40,000 a month in bills from their lawyer or more, they go away. You win. Now, the, the, the thing that I want you to remember is that while I'm saying this in a cautionary way, there's probably somebody out there saying, yay. You know, it's, so that's, it's, it's something that you, you just have to understand the rules of the game. And that is one of the ways the game, you know, the rules are played. Here at the Learner School, they talk about business ethics. And it's impossible to have a, a system with any reliability that doesn't have it. But like anything where the reward is high, there's a lot of competition. And for some people, it's sometimes worth the risk to step over and to see what happens. Uh, this is um, something that I would suggest. Recognize impulsivity in yourself. Uh, the worst part about being reckless is that it is sometimes rewarded. But that only encourages people to be reckless again because they feel that they have, they're divinely inspired in some respect. Eventually it catches up with you. you know, it, it, do your homework before you yeah, enter the arena. Um, and, and this is more of a public policy thought. And some of these I've, I've actually kind of relegated to the back. And, and please, you know, ask me any questions or ask me to clarify what it is I mean by saying it. But don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg, whether you're in business or you're in government. Redistribution of wealth is popular. And if there were really gross inequities, it, you, need, you need to do some of that. I mean, you don't want people living in abject poverty. It's not good for them, it's not good for society, it's not good for the well-being of the country. But wealth has to be created before it can be redistributed. And you can't make life difficult for the people that create jobs. I've got both in my family. I've got both in me. Uh, there are there are totally different worldviews out there between entrepreneurs and people that aren't. I mean, obviously there's some overlap, a leg in each world, and I get that. But I'm sure that there are people right here that are saying, you're in, you're in college now, and you're saying to yourself, I can't wait to get out to get a good job. And maybe two seats down from you, there's somebody that's saying, I can't wait to get out of here and start a business. And they're just totally different worldviews. There are people that cannot imagine working for anybody else. And then there are others who can't imagine not working for anybody else. The only time that the situation gets exasperating or there, there is when there's a dissonance between what it is you want to be and what it is you think you are and what it is you are today, what it is you're doing today. When there's a dissonance there, you're in an unhappy state of mind. When the entrepreneur is working for somebody else, that makes the person unhappy. When a person is somehow, and this is more, um, you, you actually, it's the 
learning period, when somebody be, you know, goes in to be an entrepreneur and they're not really meant to do um, all of the things that an entrepreneur needs to do, which means get the financing lined up, meet payroll, deal with unruly employees, get the lease, get the contracts, commit your mortgage. And, and, and by the way, I, I don't mean to make this sound lopsided. At bottom, everybody always works for themselves. You, know, you, you have to have that point of view. Because I may be the entrepreneur. It may be my drive and my vision that goes out and borrows money and puts my house and everything I've owned or been lucky enough to inherit at, at risk. But if you're the employee, you may be giving up another job to join this one. You may be there for eight years thinking that you were going to make a whole lot of money and you're going to be able to retire happily with your family in some nice place. And the business goes under. So you're invested too, not maybe as much as the entrepreneur, but your ego, your life circumstance, your well-being is at risk even as an employee. So you do have an interest in the outcome of the business. Yes? It's a, I think it's an excellent question, and I think maybe for the first time in a long time, schools are beginning to take entrepreneurship seriously. There are charter schools now that are dealing with that, special schools where they try to develop an entrepreneurial attitude. But I would say in general, <sighs> Well, ask, ask those of you out there, let me just uh, reflect it back to you. Come out of high school, how many courses about what you need to be able to do to open a business did, did you take in high school? Did they have anything like that? No. I mean, I used to th I'm a very practical guy. I, I used to love the idea of like, the, the European model of education where you'd sort of like uh, learn math, learn physics, and learn how they're integrated. You know, I, could be, I used to take a lot of math classes. And I would study math, and, but in the abstract, as somebody that didn't come from a family where didn't even know what engineers did, I knew that I could do math problems, but I didn't really know how they applied to chemistry and how they applied to physics. You know, how you fix things, how you made things. It was, to me, it was just an abstract discipline that required rigorous thinking, but I didn't know what to do with it. In Europe, it wasn't taught that way. There was a guy named Wittgenstein a long time ago. He was a philosopher, a logician. He got involved in the educational system in Germany. And he integrated the sciences with mathematics and the, and the, the technical aspects of how to actually fix things, to feel useful, to feel competent. There was a, a, a philosopher, I think his name, a psychoanalyst as well. His name was, Al, the last name was Adler. And his whole psychology was built around the feeling of being competent. We all need that. I mean, when, when people snap out, it's because their sense of competence and self-worth are savaged. You know, they, they need to react because you showed them disrespect. Because they, internally, they just don't feel, they don't respect themselves. You know, it's like, You've, you've attacked, they interpret what you've said or done as an attack on their being. And yeah, and it's, it's, it's probably not directly, but it's sort of surrounding an answer to your question. The idea of non-being, when I, when I was younger, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre talked, you know, being and nothingness and being and non-being. It occurred to me that what you're really talking about when you're talking about non-being it's whatever you need as an individual to be, to be, to be happy, to feel good about yourself. If somebody threatens that, if money is what makes you feel good about yourself and you don't have it, you don't feel good about yourself. If you need to be the best player on the team and a lateral transfer comes in from another college and is now the best 
person on the team and you're displaced, your whole sense of self-worth is savage. Whoops. That's what that's what it means to, to be, I mean, that's, that's how I interpret the concept of non-being in everyday life. It's not just about death, it's not just about disfigurement. It's about not feeling competent and, and really liking yourself, feeling like you are the person that you want to be. So in answer to, do I think the schools are really preparing? I don't think that's the focus. And I think that to the extent that we could actually get people focused on careers, science, and this, you know, the STEM programs are happening now. Right here, the university is a big part of that. And I think that's, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, we need more of it. But go ahead. I'm sorry? I'm having trouble here. It's, there's a little bit of noise. If we are what? If, if we are in the... Undecided? No, if, if we are studying the process, oh. if we don't have a lot of previous experience, because oh, it's true. almost like a new concept, then how can you teach successful approaches if you don't have a lot of previous experience to show them which case you Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question, but the, the interesting thing in, in the midst of all that, uh, in my lifetime, well, let me begin with my grandfather's lifetime. And this is one of the benefits of an open society, is it allows talent to percolate up. It, it, Karl Popper once said, he had a great line, there's no substitute for genius. And that doesn't mean that genius doesn't need a helping hand and guidance and structure and, you know, to really optimize itself. But it, this country, in, my grandfather came here when he was 11 years old from Italy without his family. There, in his lifetime, they went from riding carts to driving cars to flying planes to trains no longer choking coal but, you know, being high-speed uh, electrical, you know, electrically driven uh, vehicles to having space exploration. You know, all of that happened in the space of his 90 eight years on earth. It happens. Entrepreneurs will be entrepreneurial. To some extent, it's a God-given instinct. But I think your question is, how do we, for those for whom it could happen, maybe not happen, how do we get more people to become entrepreneurial? I think a sense of uh, public service would be good. Because nothing, if people don't work, I mean, going back to Adler, how do you feel good about yourself if you don't have a job? There's, there's probably nothing more important in government service, I mean, other than you know, national security, than, than creating a strong middle class that has jobs that they like, that they, you know, that they can support their family and that they can feel good about. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, other than insisting, other than valuing education, which I can tell you also has gone through in my lifetime, has changed dramatically. When I was, when I was a kid, I, I went to Catholic school as a, as a uh, youngster. I went to public school later on uh, in high school. But in my community, well, first of all, let me ask you this, because I, 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 I teach at another university, and I've raised this a couple of times, and I've seen the shock in their eyes. How many kids, uh, in first grade, how many kids did you think, would you think, that I had in my first grade class? Fifteen? Any, anybody else? Okay, anybody else? 
Okay. In my first grade class, we had 100 kids. We were crammed from the front of the class to the back of the class. Eventually, that kind of didn't work out after first grade. I think we then went down to 55 kids that kind of split it. But learning was possible. Now, with the nuns, it wasn't like they, they lectured a lot. They drilled. It was all drilling. You learn to do the scales so that your creative genius can, learn, can then create its own music. You know, that, that, was, that was the plan. Learn the basics. And then with the basics, we don't want you to learn how to read and write. The only person that can stop you from being educated is you. You've got libraries full of good thinkers. If you read one and he's, that he or she's not talking your language, you pick up another book and find somebody that is talking your language. You're looking for a kindred soul. And that's what inspires people. That appetite for education was there. And it wasn't because, when I was a kid, and it wasn't because, as I said, the nuns were great lecturers. They, had, they organized the classroom. And in fact, they called on us as students to teach. We would be part of the drilling, the tutoring. Somebody didn't understand something and somebody knew, somebody did understand it, then it was our job to teach it to the people that didn't know it. We learned it better because there's not a better way to learn than to teach. And the other person learned it, you know, at least learned it well, well enough to progress through school. That attitude, I started to say that what made the nuns effective wasn't just the nuns and their discipline and their organization, but it was the respect for the organization. It was the sense that God gave us a gift. He gave us an opportunity. And we need to learn as much as we can learn for ourselves, for our family, so that we can be useful to them and help them, and for our community. The sense of, of a greater community was something that I just grew up with. It just seems right. It seemed natural. That isn't if, if there's a weakness today, it's that there is a lack of coherence to the community. That it, it's, the, the vectors aren't all lined up. They don't support one another anymore. It's kind of like me and me against the world. And, and that's what has to change. We, we need to develop a sense of community. We need to develop a sense of family. And, you, and you, as a result, you just want to do better for the people you care about. I, mean, I do a lot of work in the, in the uh, drug abuse area. One of the things that it, 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 it torments me, it disturbs me, is to see the number of people that, because of drug abuse, waste opportunities. They, they hurt themselves. They hurt everyone that loves them. The, the, the school district keeps trying to pour more money in, and, and this is a public policy issue that I'm just, as you're all smart thinking adults, and if you're not paying taxes now, you will be soon. If you have, if the problem is really only incidentally in the school, or supportively in the school with, with drug abuse, and the kids in school seven hours a day, or seven and a half hours a day, but the bigger problem is outside the school, how do you want to spend public resources? Are they being effectively spent by pouring more and more money into the seven hours? Or is it like this bottle? It only holds, has so much volume. You keep pouring the water in, it spills on the floor. It's only going to hold so much. And maybe, just maybe, is that, the way, is that kind of the way we've been dealing with the problems, you know, with underperformance in the schools? Maybe some of that money needs to be spent in the community. It needs to be built strengthening families, creating jobs, giving people hope. When somebody's doing drugs, what, what's, there's one phrase that I think everybody, anybody that knows anybody that does drugs abusively uh, will hear. So, 
I don't care. It doesn't matter. That's what drugs do. You don't care. Nothing does matter. It cuts you off from yourself. It's sort of like a, a deadness to the eyes. And I, I, mean, I, I can tell you, I, I just had some police officers and a councilwoman into my class uh, at, the other, at the other university talking about crime in Wilmington. And that's what, you know, you've got to, uh, you got to deal with the drug issue because you can't out-police the problem. You can't, you can't keep pour, pouring money into education, and, you know, within that seven hour block of time when the other 17 hours are, are making the investment diffuse, unfocused. So, so a, long, a lot of points that are being made, not totally on point in, in being responsive to you. But the, what you need to have is opportunity. And you need to have a sense of community. And out of that, that positive outlook on life, that sense that I can do it, that's where the solution is. I think it's great, you know, what the governor's doing here and what's happening in other places around the country. The concentration on science and technology, all of that is wonderful. You know, I, again, when I was in school, I used to, I came out of school, I think I even came out because I was a philosophy major. When I came out of, uh, when I came out of undergraduate school, I thought, my God, I can't change a tire, but I can do the Dick Cavett show. Now, that's way before your time, but it, that was a nighttime TV show, something like Jay Leno. Uh, and that's what I knew how to do. I, I think it's very important to have practical skills attend your education, to support your education throughout your educational career. You need to know how to fix a light, how, to, how the city hall works, how to, how to maybe uh, re, you know, uh, change a tire how to change the oil on your car. You might say, I'm never going to do that. But you know what? It, in there, it solidifies you. It makes you feel competent that you can do these things. I think it's very important to impart that. There was a guy that, uh, he was a true believer. And uh, he lived in a low-lying area of town, close to a river. And they had been warned that the river was going to overflow and that everybody had to evacuate. And he didn't want to evacuate. He said, I trust in God. God will save me. So the police came by and they knocked on his door as it was, had been raining and the water was starting to accumulate. And the, the police came by and said, you've got to get out. They drove in. And he said, I'm not leaving. God, you know, I believe in God and I believe God will take care of me. So the water continues to rise, and now the river's overflowing, and he's, it's now up to his porch. And these little skiffs or rowboats come by, and they say, hop in, we'll take you out of here, we'll evacuate. And the guy tells them, I'm not leaving, this is my home, I believe in God, and I believe God will protect me. The rain continues to go, now the, the, the banks of the river are overflowing. He's up now on his roof. The water is all around him and he's up on his roof. A helicopter comes in and drops a line on the bullhorn. They say to the guy, grab hold, we'll take you out. And again, he says, I believe in God, I'm not leaving, he will take care of me. The water continues to go up, he drowns. He goes to heaven and he sees God. And he says, how could you do that to me? I'm a believer, I put my faith in you. You let me die. And he said, I let you die. I sent you a car, a boat, and a plane. You know, you've got to be able to read the tea leaves and see what's, see what's really going on. And in every aspect of your life, that's not just business. You've got to be able to say, am I moving in the right direction? Is this, you know, should I be changing? Should I call it sunk money and move on? In every aspect of your life, you have, to, you have to see if life is really, 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 really too hard, maybe, just maybe, you gotta think, you're not doing something right, you might wanna rethink it. Anybody else? Thank you. I don't have any other comments right now, but I'd be glad to uh, hang around.